My own life. Good to see you. Glad to be in church. Glad to be in church. I always think Sundays when we gather is a, is a precursor for when we get to heaven. We ought to enjoy ourselves, enjoy each other, and just have a good time in the house of God. Amen. Amen. And don't need. I don't need a lot of people to have a good time. As a matter of fact, I can have a good time on my own. <laughs> I've been known to do that in, in, in my office. I'll be listening or reading something and I'll have a good time, I tell you. But uh, it's good to have a good time and share it with others. Amen. All right. Genesis 45, verse number one. We'll just read a few verses here, but we are going to look at a few other verses in this chapter throughout the course of the message. So uh, Genesis 45, verse number one. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. Then they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. I'm going to preach that. That's the title in verse number three and also in verse number four. I am Joseph. I am Joseph. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the good spirit that's here. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, we do look forward to flying away one day and being with you for all of eternity. So God, I pray that you would just bless this time in your word. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. May we see uh, in this chapter, may we see the comparison, may we see the parallels here between Joseph and our Lord and Saviour Jesus. So Lord, we want to magnify you and lift you up this morning. And we pray that that would be accomplished, that you may draw all men unto yourself. And we give you all the praise and all the thanks and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I think we'd all be on the same page if we uh, would say that there is a problem in Australia and even the world when it comes to an identity crisis. You know, when I think about countries like America, I don't know that America has been around a, lot, a long time and so has England, Great Britain, these countries and others, not just those two, but countries like that that have been around a long time, they, they have an identity to them. And uh, if there's one thing that we all know about Americans, they don't mind telling you that. <laughs> I actually admire them. You know, they think they can do anything and everything. I, I like that because we're American. You know, they go somewhere and we are American. Well, I'm Australian and I, and I would consider myself a patriotic Australian. I, I, I'm glad I'm an Australian. I'm glad I'm born in Australia. I know why I'm Australian. I'm glad I get to serve the Lord here in Australia. But I think as an Australian, I look at our nation and I think, do we actually have an identity? Do we really know who we are? And I, and I do believe that there is an identity crisis, not just on a national level. And not do I only think that we are confused about our identity. And remember, God is not the author of confusion. Satan's the author of confusion and he wants people confused and he's doing a great job today. But there's also a lot of other identity problems like today, uh, you know, are you a man or are you a woman? You know, I'm glad I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm a husband, uh, I'm, a, I'm a heterosexual, I'm a Christian, I'm a Baptist. I, I, know, I know who I am, I know what I am. I have no problem with my personal identity. And when I say who I am, I'm also declaring to people who and what I'm not. When I say I'm a heterosexual, I'm saying I'm not homosexual. When I say I'm a Baptist, I know why I'm a Baptist, and I think a lot of people struggle today when it comes to Baptist heritage or Baptist history as far as where we came from, where we didn't come out of them. We're not Protestant. We never came out of the Protestant Reformation. We've, we were around before the Protestant Reformation, and a lot of people, I think, that come into our Baptist churches don't understand the history, don't understand who we are and what we went through as an independent people when it came to martyrdom. Someone might say this, that if the Catholics had not murdered the Baptists, we would have outnumbered them today. So when I look back in our history and I see that trail of blood, I see the martyrdom that was brought upon the Baptists and other independent churches back in those days. 
I identify myself with that because of who I am and I'm not ashamed of that. But we have an identity crisis today as far as are you a man, are you a woman, are you gay, are you a heterosexual, are you a Christian? For example, when it comes to that term, I'm a, I'm a Christian, we were out door knocking on Friday, Jeff and I had a great day, great day door knocking. We just fellowshipping away, knocking on doors, talking to people. It, it, it's always been my custom and the reason why I do this because... People say, well, I go to church and, and they say, I, I, I'm a Christian. And I always ask them this question. I always say, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Because I've worked out now that just because someone goes to church, it doesn't mean that they're saved and going to heaven. And just because someone says that they are a Christian, that doesn't mean that they are a Christian and that they're going to heaven. Because they don't understand what it is to be a Christian. Well, we asked this lady, uh, she, she, you know, she was telling us before this question was asked that she was going to a certain denominational church. It was Hillsong, I'll just say. She was going to Hillsong Church at Maroochador. They'd started a church there and closed it down. She was perplexed as to why they closed it down. It was going really good. And, and she's trying to find a church. And, but she's trying to find a church that fits in with her time frame. And I'm sharing a little bit, bit about this in the adult Sunday school. She's got kids that play sport on a Sunday and she was like lamenting and saying, why can't churches have services later on so my kids can go and play sport and I can go to church and I can do this and all that. I said, well, Jesus is not going to work his time frame around your schedule. You work it around his. And so anyway, we're sitting there and, and we're standing there talking and, and then Jeff asks the question and I think he followed my lead along the way. He asked the lady the question, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? She said, I'm offended at that question. I am really offended at that question. It makes, it makes it out that you have all the answers. She says, I have a relationship with the Lord. She says, I'm offended at that question. You could have asked it in a different way. And I said, well, and then he quoted the verse, blessed are they that keep thy law and nothing shall offend them and all this sort of stuff. And I'm standing there thinking, oh, this is going to go south from here, you know what I mean? But we were able to uh, salvage it and try and be a blessing to the lady. But she was offended at that because she was asked the question, are you 100% sure that if you die today you're going to heaven? Now if someone asked me that, it would be that, no worries, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, I receive Jesus Christ as my saviour and uh, all that sort of stuff. But there are people out there today, that, and I'm not saying that she's not, she said she's got a relationship with the Lord and that's fine, but there's people out there that, today that do not understand that their identity as a Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? So when I say that there's an identity problem, there is an identity problem out there today. When you look at this passage of scripture here, and going through the, uh, the book of Genesis, we come to the life of Joseph. And the life of Joseph is a wonderful typology of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph, who was uh, sold into slavery, by, by, he was rejected of his brethren, uh, put in the pit, sold into slavery, was in Potiphar's house, was falsely accused. I was thrown into prison. The Lord was with him. Uh, the butler and the baker had a vision. Joseph told them the vision, said to the chief butler, remember me when you come out two full years later, the Pharaoh has a vision. And then the butler says, oh yeah, there's a guy in prison that can tell you the interpretation thereof. So they bring Joseph before the Pharaoh and Joseph gives the interpretation of the, uh, of the vision. Uh, Pharaoh puts him up as the governor, as like the prime minister. He's the second in charge. Uh, he marries an Egyptian lady and, uh, which speaks of a Gentile bride. And so there's so many things in the life of Joseph where we, where we parallel and say, yep, yeah, that's, a, that's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Joseph said this in verse number one, and it says, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, I found that an interesting phrase. And then of course he goes on and says, I am Joseph. And he had to do that because he would, now think about this, he wouldn't have looked like a Jewish person. He would have looked like an Egyptian. He would have had all the the regalia on, all the clothing and, and everything. He would have looked just like an Egyptian. Interesting, when Jesus came, he, he looked just like his brethren. You know what I mean? There was no difference between him and the look of his brethren. He didn't have long blonde hair, by the way. That's the way the homosexuals paint him in his pictures. But that was not Jesus. But, Jesus, but Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. An interesting thing about that is that you could be saved this morning 
But Jesus still wants to make himself known to you. He wants to make himself known to you. And if we don't know who Jesus is, if, if Jesus doesn't reveal himself to us on a daily basis or a weekly basis, and he's not making himself known unto us, what hope does the world have? Because unless, unless he is revealed to us as far as who he is, how are we going to take Christ and reveal him to the world? So it's important that we know that Jesus makes himself known to us. So when we look at this passage this morning, we're going to ask ourselves the question, in what way did Joseph reveal himself to his brethren? Or in what way will Jesus reveal himself to his brethren? Because I don't know about you, I, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about the Lord. I want to know more about my Heavenly Father. I want to know more about the Holy Spirit. I'm certainly glad that when I got saved, I didn't know everything. I'm certainly glad that on this journey of the Christian life, that I get to know more about Him on a daily basis. And by the way, how much Jesus reveals Himself to me is dependent on how much I want Him to reveal Himself to me. Do I want to know Him more? And by the way, the more I get to know Him... The less I like about myself. I see things in me that needs to change. So maybe that's a reason why not too many Christians want Jesus to reveal himself to the brethren. Because the more that he does, the more that we know about God, the more that we know about his holiness, the more we know about our Saviour, the more the responsibility is placed upon us to be like him. Isn't that the goal? We are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not to be transform, uh, conformed to the things of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The more that we're in the book, by the way, this is the revelation of God. The more that we're in the book, the more that the Spirit of God will reveal our God, our Saviour to us. Do you want Jesus to reveal himself to you? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely I want Jesus to reveal himself. But in what way did Joseph and in what way does Jesus reveal himself to us? Would you look at verse number five? Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. The way that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you is that he wants to reveal himself as your life preserver. We all know what a life preserver is when you go out. Oh, by the way, I hate boating. I really don't <laughs> like boating. I, uh, God bless those that go out on the high seas and they go fishing. I'd rather fish from a jetty or from the beach. Uh, that's just me. I don't want to go out in the boat. I don't like boats. I see too many... Uh, um, Stories on capsized boats and so on. So I'm a land lover. I like my feet on the ground. But we all know that when you go out on the boat, they've got the life preserver. They've got the life vest. And so if someone falls overboard, what happens? The life preserver. It's there for you to grab onto and it's there to preserve your life to keep you safe. So isn't that a great way that Jesus wants you to know? He says, I want to reveal myself to you as your life preserver. I am a firm believer in the preservation of the saints, not the perseverance of the saints. Because there are some out there that say, well, we believe in the perseverance of the saints, which means that as long as I persevere, I'll make it. But that, that's based upon me then. Whereas when we think about the preservation of the saints, it's all the work of God and none of me. I'm certainly glad about that. And if you think, well, give me some scripture on that. I'm glad you asked. Let me read these verses to you. In Jude chapter 1 and verse number 1, listen to this. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Who are you preserved in? You're preserved in Jesus Christ. He's your preserver. He's your life preserver. He is the one who has preserved your life. In other words, we say this. We believe in the eternal security of the believer. Why is that? Because I'm preserved in Jesus Christ. How many... I know it's a different generation. Not too many people do it today. My grandmother used to do it of that era. But they used to preserve jams. Make jams and... 
uh, they would do that and add all the stuff to it and put the lid on and put it over here and, and it would be preserved. You, could, you can use it down through the weeks and even the following year because it's been preserved. So what he's saying is that because we're in Christ, because we've, pres we've been preserved in Christ, I believe through that we've been saved for all eternity. And so Jesus wants to reveal himself to you as your life preserver. He wants you to, he doesn't want you to go through life not knowing and not having assurance. And we've said this time and time again to people out there that say they go to church, they're Christians, and when, they, when I ask them the question, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And more often than not, they say, I hope so. Well, let me just say this, that the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christianity is not a hope so salvation. It's a, it's a, it's a, can I put it this way? And I hate using the term, it's a religion of assurance that you may know that you have eternal life and your preservation is not in what you do and what I do. Your preservation is in what he's done. He's your life preserver. And so Joseph, like Jesus, wants us to know that he is our preserver of life. Let me read this verse to you in Psalm 37, verse 28. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. Are you a saint? You better say yes. We ask this same, same question while we're out. We ask, are you a saint? Well... And they always think Roman Catholic, you know, you've got to live and do all these miracles and say, and then you become a saint, Saint Teresa and Saint Michael and all this sort of stuff. And, but when you got saved, the Bible says you went from being a sinner to a saint. And so the Bible says in Psalm 37, he says, he says, he forsaketh not his saints. That's you who are in Christ. They, the saints are preserved forever. That gives me great comfort. I like that. I know that I'm preserved in Jesus. Listen to this verse in 2 Timothy 4.18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. What a blessing. What a blessing to know that the day that you got saved, you became a saint, you became in Christ, you've been preserved. And Jesus says, you know what? I don't want you to live life without assurance. I don't want you to go through this life wondering from one day to the next whether when you die if you're going to go to heaven or not. I don't want you even to doubt one moment because you're meant to be resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And aren't you glad that Easter's coming up and when we think about Easter, we think of his death, burial and resurrection. And when we think about that, we think of this amazing work that Jesus Christ did so that he could give us eternal life. He can forgive our sins and he can preserve us forever. What a blessing that is. If it's all of Jesus Christ, and I could never understand if, if it's all of Jesus Christ, if it's by his grace that I'm saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. If I can do nothing to be saved, why is it that I can do something to not be saved? Because it's a lack of understanding when it comes to the scriptures and the very fact that we have been preserved in Jesus Christ. Joseph revealed himself to his brethren because he says, God did send me before you to preserve life. Are you glad about that? Yeah. Look at uh, verses number six to eight. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall be neither, uh, neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your life by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse number seven is where we get the second, second thing. It says this, to save your lives by a great deliverance. You know the way that Joseph revealed himself when he says, I am Joseph. The way that he revealed himself and the way that Jesus wants to reveal himself to the brethren, he wants to reveal himself as our great deliverer. Listen, when we got saved, we were delivered. And I believe in deliverance. 
I'm not talking about the deliverance of the wacky deliverance and the crying and the barking and all this sort of stuff. I'm talking about my great deliverer, the great emancipator, that when I got saved, he delivered me from hell. He delivered me from the power and the penalty of sin. He washed me. He delivered me from all of that. And by the way, when he delivered me from that, he delivered me from so much more than that. Let me read something to you in Galatians 1 and verse number 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Do you know that there's going to be a day that because you're saved that you're going to be delivered from this present evil world? Would you say that the world is an evil place? Would you say that when you look out here there's nothing good out there? There is nothing good out there for any Christians. It's just wicked, it's bad, it's evil and Jesus said this, that I saved you to deliver you from this present evil world. I could never understand why Christians want to go back into the world and be like the world and live like the world and I can say that because I did it and I think why in the world did I do that? Why would I want to go back? Just like the verse says, and the, and the, and the, the swine goes back to a wallowing and the dog returns to the vomit. That's gross. Have you ever seen the dog return to his vomit? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. And you see it all the time. And the dog's out there hacking its guts up and then a few minutes later it goes back to its sniff around and starts eating. It's like, you know. <laughs> it's gross, isn't it? And so God is saying, why do you want to go back to the world? It's corrupt, it's bad, it's vulgar, it's vile, it's corrupt. He's preserved me from that. I'm going to be delivered from this present evil world. Hebrews 2.15, let me read this to you. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He delivered me who through fear of death. There are people out there, and I don't know whether you're one of them, I know that there are some Christians who are afraid to die. I think their fear is the way they're going to die. Because it's like, if you said, if you said how do you want to die? Everyone mostly says, I want to wait till Jesus gets here. You know what I mean? I don't want to go through the door of death. I want to wait till I'm raptured up. Or, I just want to, I just want to go in my sleep. <laughs> if, I'm, if I die, I just want to die in my sleep. I don't want to know anything about it. Just and, and I just want to go to sleep and then wake up in the presence of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's some people that want to go that way. But you know, reality is this: when we look down through the ages, how many saints went through martyrdom? How many saints have gone have gone to be with Jesus through cancer and through so many different things? And, and I'm a believer in this too because I've seen it. Time and time again, I've seen family, brothers and sisters in Christ that have died in cancer, but God gives them a, a kind of grace that is really unexplainable. That, that cancer, which is a very painful and, and, and it's a sad thing, and yet Christians seem to have this grace upon them, and God just seems to, to deliver them from the pain and suffering and just bang, take them to be with Him. How many times have we read in the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and we see people burned at the stake for their Christianity, and yet they can, they can be burning and yet singing the praises of God. Because God knows how to give them a grace to help them through that. So when I think about, when I think about delivering, I'm glad he's delivered me through the fear of death. And it's a bondage. 2 Peter 2.9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. So when we think about our great deliverer, when we think about Jesus Christ who came to deliver us, he delivered us from sin, he delivered us from hell, he's delivered us from this present evil world, he's delivered us through fear of death, he delivers us out of temptation, he delivers us from evil men, the Bible says he delivers us from all my fears, he delivers me from the power of darkness, and he's going to deliver me from the wrath to come. Now don't get too excited about that. But this is what Jesus did. So in type, when we look at Joseph and he, he makes himself known to his brethren and he says, I'm Joseph. Jesus wants to reveal himself to his brethren and say, I'm Jesus. You remember when, uh, when, when Jesus says to Peter, he says, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, well, we'll say one of the prophets on the Baptist. Says that. Then he says, who do you say that I am? He says, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, blessed art thou, son, because flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. 
Do you know it was the same Jesus that when Paul was knocked to his knocked to the ground on the road to Damascus, and then when Paul, the apostle Paul is Saul back then, when he says, Lord, who art thou? You know what Jesus' response was? I am Jesus. I am Jesus. So when we think about Jesus and his revealing to us, he wants to reveal himself not only as our life preserver, but as our deliverer. Look at verses 9 to 11. He says, he says, haste you and go up to my father and say unto him, thus saith the son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And now look at this. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. I want to say this, that Jesus wants to reveal himself as our provider. As our provider. Why do we worry about provision? Why do we worry about that? Lack of, faith. Lack of faith. Why do we get anxious? When the Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Why do we worry? If we allow Jesus to reveal himself to us as our provider, he says, tell them to come. They can live in Goshen. Do you remember when the great judgment was coming upon the Egypt? It was dark in Egypt, but there was light in Goshen. And Joseph is saying, if you come and be where I am, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to take care of you. There's five years left of famine, but don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. And this is exactly what Jesus wants to do for you and for me. He wants to take care of us. Casting all your care upon him, the Bible says, because he careth for you. But sometimes we don't believe that. We struggle with that. Hebrews 11 and verse number 40 says this, that he has provided better things for us. Better things. When you look through the book of Hebrews, I love the book of Hebrews. It is a book about better things. Jesus was better than the angels. Jesus had better promises, a better covenant, a better blood, a better sacrifice. It was, it was everything under Jesus was better. He has provided some better things for us. He nourishes us. He takes care of us. You know, in Matthew chapter 6, we won't turn there because we could be here all day looking at scriptures. But if we went to Matthew chapter 6, we would see that he says, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve mammon and God. But Jesus in his wisdom says this. He says, therefore I say unto you, and he goes on and he says, if you serve me, he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. Can you and he mentions the, the, the lilies and the fowls of the air. And he says, you know, and he mentions, he says, why, why by taking thought, can you add one cubit to your stature? By worrying, can you grow physically? By worrying, does your bills get paid? By worrying, does your health get fixed? By, no, worry produces nothing but more of the same thing. But Jesus says, if you, if you follow me, he says, I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. Do we know him as our great provider? Or do we get worried because we've got nothing? We get worried because, because there's, there's no petrol in the car. There's no money in the bank. It's like, you know, we, we've got to go down to the, the, the emergency because there's chest pains and stuff like that. It's like, and I'm sitting there, I'm praying before I'm going, Lord, I believe you, heal me, touch me, all this sort of stuff. Like, I don't want to go in a hospital. I don't want to, I want to be in church on Sunday, Lord. And I'm trying to persuade him, you know what I mean? I'm trying to, trying to butter him up. Lord, you've given me a message for your people. I can't go into hospital. Or, you, you know, you're doing your blood pressure and, you, you, you know, your, your wife gets put on another tablet because the blood pressure's not coming down and so on. And, so, and Satan just has a way of making us worry. Take no thought for your life. Gee, don't worry about your life. I'll take care of it. And we know that here. But do we know it here? So when Joseph slash Jesus made himself known to his brethren and says, I am Joseph. And when we look at this, he says he revealed himself as their great provider. Let's jump on down to verse number 24. Verse 24. So he sent his brethren away and they departed 
And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan and Jacob their father. And told him saying, now here it is, look at this, this is amazing. Joseph is yet alive. Joseph is yet alive. And he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. You know, Jesus wants to reveal himself to us as our living saviour. Living. I know we sing living for Jesus and we sing he lives. But you know, I'm sure that there are times in our life that sometimes... We doubt. Are you really there, Lord? A living saviour. I'm glad. Listen, I'm so glad that as a young boy, I was told about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank God for every person that, that gets saved out of a, uh, uh, a religion of works or whatever it is. Because it's like, and I say this to people all the time. I love witnessing to Catholics, but I always say, you, you, you guys have still got Jesus on the cross. Yeah. He's no longer on the cross. He's no longer dead. He's alive. Jesus is alive. He is not a dead saviour. He's not a dead God. He is a living God. And you know what? Isn't it amazing that when Jacob heard about that, before that, he was, he was doubtful. He was, he was worrying. And when he heard about it and when he saw the wagons coming, it says that the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Do you know when we see Jesus for who he is as far as our provider, our, 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 our preserver, our deliverer, and when we see him as our living saviour, do you know what? this does for me it revives my spirit we don't have a dead religion we've got a living Christ we serve a living saviour notice though something very important look at verse number 24 again he says so he sent his brethren away he sent the brethren to go and tell others that Joseph is alive Jesus is sending us to tell the world that he's alive. They may not believe us. And very few do. But that doesn't mean that we stop from going. It doesn't mean that we don't head out of track. It doesn't mean that we don't say a word for Jesus. It doesn't mean that when, when we're at the bank teller. Or some other place. And someone says how was your day? What are you doing tomorrow? What have you done? And very few of us say well I'm going to church tomorrow. I'm going to church and I'm doing this. Very few Christians share a word about Jesus to people. To let them know that he is alive. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 3, it says this, To whom, this is Jesus, also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. In other words, there was no doubt about it. There was no doubt about it. Thomas wanted to see it, but Jesus said, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. I don't think anyone here has seen Jesus literally. If you have... Go. <laughs> you probably had too much pizza or something. But we believe. We believe. We believe he's alive. Why do we believe he's alive? Because, because number one, the Bible says it. And number two, when we got saved, a transformation took place in our life. A living saviour took up residence. And I was dead and now I'm alive. He gave me life. How cruel of me to just experience that and not try and share it with a dead world. Or how cruel of me even to have that and not encourage your brother or sister in Christ about that. Because again, he's going to the brethren. And it may be that there's a brother or sister that's struggling and having a hard time. And let's not get on them. My goodness, even John the Baptist doubted that it was Jesus. 
And Jesus said to John's disciples, you go tell John that the, that the, the lame walk and the blind see and, and so on and so forth. You don't have to look for someone else, John. I'm, I'm the right one. Even John the Baptist doubted. Even Thomas doubted. Even Peter denied and doubted. So let's not cut crook at a brother or sister that's having a time of doubt. We ought to be there to encourage a brother or sister that there is a Jesus who's alive. I am Joseph. Or, I am Jesus. And he made himself known to the brethren. And I want to say to you that Jesus wants to make himself known to you. In a more personal and intimate way than perhaps you've ever experienced him before. Not as, just as your life preserver, but as your deliverer, as your provider and he wants you to know that he is a living saviour. This is a, listen folks, every, every day of the year is a great day to witness to Jesus. But this is Easter. The world wants to kill Easter. The world wants to do what? They don't want to know about a living saviour. Are we going to tell the world about a living saviour or are we just going to let it die? Because we're all responsible to make sure that we share a living saviour with a dead world. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for the word of God. I pray that our hearts will be stirred. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for making yourself known and for continually making yourself known as the preserver of our life, as the deliverer, as the provider, as a living saviour. God, I pray that, Lord, as we've been encouraged today, that we would take this living message, this message of hope to a dark and despairing world. I pray that you would help us to serve you in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that you are alive. Thank you again for making yourself known to us. Bless as we go now, as we travel uh, back home. I pray that you would keep us safe on the road. And Lord, I pray that we would be gathered back here again tonight at five o'clock to hear a message from your word. Another message of encouragement, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.